team. Today, Dr. Balakrishnan will tell us about Bala Koinor or the little Koinor, a diamond that belongs to history. Afterwards, she will answer some questions that you will be asking in the chat. And our digital whiz, Vrinda Aurora, will be supervising this webinar. And uh, Usha, the floor, the virtual floor, is absolutely yours now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yaku, for that uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Vrinda. Uh, pleasure to be on this evening to share the story of uh, what I think uh, is a diamond that has had once been forgotten and now it has taken its rightful place in history. I'm just going to share my screen. So, whether embedded in the eyes of gods or flashing like beacons from splendid thrones, diamonds have adorned the crowns of kings, the turbans of rajas, sparkled in necklaces, earrings, armbands, and even in anklets. So my talk this evening traces the early history and journey of a gem, which originated in a massive graph that weighed 450 carats. It ranked among the largest diamonds in the world at the time of its discovery. The stone was originally named Bala Kohinoor or Little Kohinoor after its then well-known bigger brethren, uh, the Kohinoor of course, but eventually its name was changed to Nizam by virtue of the fact that it was discovered in the territory of the Nizam of Hyderabad and it was deposited in the treasury of the Nizam of Hyderabad. And the Nizam, as we all know, was the king of the Deccan. So I'm just sharing this little video um, of the stone. The Nizam's formidable treasury included some of the most fabulous gemstones and jewels in the world. But few pieces in the collection compared in grandeur to the stone in front of you, the Bala Kohino. The diamond now weighs a majestic 120.8 carats. It is a type 2A, D flawless, irregular pear-shaped diamond. So delving into literature and archives, I will piece together over the next 30 to 40 minutes, the story of its discovery in the diamond mines of Golconda to its checkered sojourn in the court of the Nizams of Hyderabad. And I'll talk ultimately, more recently, to the time when it took its rightful place in the hall of fame of great Golconda diamonds. I'm going to run this clip once again, and I want you to notice the crown and pavilion are flat, the table is long, the culet is broad, and the angle of the crown and pavilion facets is shallow, typical of old cut diamonds, especially those that were cut in India at the time. But before I trace the story of the Bala Kohinoor itself, let me start by sharing a small collection of jewels from the Nizam's treasury every single one set with fabulous diamonds. Now, Golconda is the term by which all these diamonds are known. You can see it on the map on the top left side of the screen, named for the kingdom where the mines were located. And there were no less than 38 mines that were active across the Deccan Plateau, the region that I have marked encircled in red. It lay between the Krishna and Penar rivers. In the 18th century, much of this region formed part of the Nizam of Hyderabad's dominions. Now, once mined, the largest and best stones were deposited in the state treasury, and millions of carats were traded in the majestic Golconda Fort, the bottom right of your screen, located on the outskirts of Hyderabad. Golconda was one of the most diamantiferous regions of the world, it almost exclusively supplied the world with diamonds for more than 1,500 years. Golconda diamonds are known for their transparency, their luminosity, rarity, and color. In fact, even today in the diamond trade, the term Golconda has, has almost become a brand name. 
It is used to describe stones that are exceptionally transparent and brilliant. Now, of all the regalia of Indian royalty, turban ornaments, known as the sarpej, the sarpati, the jigga, the kalgi, the tura, and so on, were the most visible symbols of monarchy, power, and wealth because they were worn on the turban and were visible to the entire, uh, all the subjects in the hall of audience. And the finest gems in the treasury were used for these jewels. As you can see in the three jewels on the screen in front of you, they date to the early 18th century. The plume on top is known as the kalgi. It is in the form of a stylized feather. It features a pear-shaped diamond in the center that weighs approximately 25 carats. The long necklace style sarpati in the middle features 31 table cut diamonds, while the thin slices that form the diamond petals in the bottom jewel are delicately framed in gold. And look at the little photograph of the little princess uh, on the left side of your screen. Uh, it is the young Prince Salabadja and his sister, uh, who were children of the sixth Nizam of Hyderabad, Mehbub Ali Pasha. They are all adorned heavily with jewels, both the little children. And look closely, you can see the sarpati that, you, that is in the center of the screen draped around the young prince's cap. The jewel on the left, also turban ornament is a spectacular sarpej attributed to the Asadja treasury set with large table cut diamonds of varying sizes and shapes, but all cleverly faceted around the edge to refract light, creating the flashes and sparkles that enhance the magical quality of diamonds. That particular jewel is now part of the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And on the right below is actually a child's sarpej, specially made for the child of the sixth Nizam. The elegant and beautifully designed jewel is set with a pear-shaped rose-cut diamond in the center that weighs approximately 12 carats. The total weight of all the other diamonds together in this jewel is in excess of 100 carats. The luster and luminosity that characterize Golconda gems are apparent in the collection of diamonds in these jewels. Now, Indian lapidaries improved the rose cut and Mughal cut to make optimum use of irregular stones, most importantly, without reducing their weight. This portrait on the left of the seventh Nizam, Mir Mosman Ali Khan, was taken after his ascension to the throne in 1911. The Nizam is dressed in luminous white garments, which are a perfect foil for the two spectacular pieces of diamond jewelry encrusted, diamond encrusted jewels on the right. The necklace in a delicate lazy bell epoque style is set with round and oval diamonds. There are more than 226 old cut Golconda diamonds of different shapes and sizes but assembled so cleverly and beautifully that it forms a perfectly symmetrical and well-proportioned necklace. The total weight of these 226 diamonds is estimated to be more than 150 carats. The brooch, the present moon brooch on top is set also with old cut diamonds and the diamond, the round diamond in the center weighs 30 carats. Two necklaces, again from the Nizam's treasury, set with a fabulous collection of diamonds. The one on the left with old cut golden colored diamonds, alternating with button pearls. The pendant, if you look closely over here, is composed of two diamond beads, each weighing 20 carats, while the briolet diamond here at the bottom weighs 130 carats. And the necklace on the right, which dates to the 19th century is set with 12 large flat diamond slices, altogether weighing about 250 carats. Now immense quantities of flat diamonds such as these were used in traditional Mughal jewelry. Because always sensitive to the rarity and value of diamonds, 
Gem quality ruffs were never reduced in size. They were merely faceted around the edges or across the surface, resulting in the rose cut, just to hide um, flaws and camouflage chips. This is the work of the versatile Indian lapidaries. They cleaved the stones to get into slices to get as many stones as possible from the rough. Another beautiful jewel from the Nizam's tre treasury. This is a diamond buckle or bugloos. And if you look closely at the portrait of the young sixth Nizam on the left, he's wearing this belt around his waist. Again, the gems together weigh approximately 100 carats. Look at the backside of the gold uh, belt buckle, beautifully etched with floral motives. Now, among the most spectacular jewels in the Nizam treasuries were, of course, the male jewels. And you can see it in this stunning diamond belt in an open work paisley design. The belt was actually manufactured in Paris by the renowned French jewelry uh, designer, Oscar Massin. The story goes that the Nizam's representative went to Paris, walked into Oscar Massin's studio with a wooden bowl full of golden colder uh, Golconda diamonds and commissioned this belt for the Nizam. It is set with 245 oval and pear shaped Golconda diamonds. And the combined weight of the stones in this one uh, belt is in excess of 640 carats. The armband on top, again, is indicative of the sheer quantity of diamonds in the Hyderabad treasury. More than 1,500 carats of Golconda diamonds are set just in these few jewels that I'm sharing with you today. Women were not an exception either. The Nizam's wives were not neglected, as you can see in this photograph of one of the wives of the, sixth, uh, the seventh Nizam, Miros Ali Khan. Look at her jewels on the right side of the screen. Every single piece of jewelry is set with diamonds. And there were hundreds, literally hundreds of such sets that were manufactured in the imperial ateliers. This rare photograph features Osman Ali Khan with his principal wife, Dulan Pasha Begum. Look at the fabulous diamond encrusted Tora Pound anklets on the right. And if you look very closely at the photograph, you can see um, the lady, the Nizam's wife, actually wearing an anklet, perhaps the same one or something that was very close to it. All the diamonds here are set, uh, are claw set in perfectly articulated gold mounds. Two more anklets from the Nizam's collection, again set with diamonds. And look at the, the two pendants on the right side. Again, a splendid collection of Golconda diamonds. In fact, the, the diamonds in the anklet on the bottom is weighs in excess of 250 carats. So having given you a small peek, this is literally a small peek into the Nizam's treasury. Remember the collection of jewels numbered in the thousands and loose gemstones in the tens of thousands, of which the largest quantity were diamonds and pearls. Unfortunately, with the exception of a few, literally a few hundred items, the entire collection has been dispersed, sold, melted down, and the gemstones very sadly cut and recycled into new settings. Countless gems have vanished from sight only to re-emerge after many years. But sadly, some will remain hidden forever. Many are shrouded in mystery. Their past reconstructed from apocryphal stories about their origins and journeys through the centuries. Many great Golconda diamonds have already revealed their history. They have been chronicled. We know the stories of the Kohinoor, for example, or the Orlov, the Hope, the Regent, the Sansi. And even we heard about the stories of the Nasak and the Pigot diamonds uh, from Jack Ogden in January. So now let me share and unravel the story of the Nizam diamond, the diamond that was originally known as the Bala Kohinu or Little Kohinu. In March 2019, 
A fabulous diamond was the showstopper in the jewelry section at the TFAF Maastricht Art Fair. It was exhibited by the world-renowned gallery Sigelson of New York. The piece was a, and you can see the necklace on the screen in front of you. It was a Mughal-inspired necklace featuring Colombian emerald beads and rubies from which was suspended an internally flawless D-color type 2A 120.8 carat diamond. This mysterious precious stone was not known. It had not been seen for more than 100 years. It was displayed at the fair simply as the Nizam diamond. It created a flutter in the world of jewelry. After all, how often does a more than 100 carat Golconda diamond emerge from hiding? The renowned diamond merchant and jeweler Edwin Streeter had written more than 100 years ago, and I quote, the birth of an exceptional stone is usually proclaimed to the world and its subsequent travels and adventures are chronicled. And I hope that now I, Diamonds Across Time, where I have contributed an essay on the stone, has chronicled the story and the journey of this spectacular gemstone. The gem actually was brought to my attention almost five years before it made its appearance on the world stage. I was asked to study and research its history, and I was given a single cryptic clue, the Nizam. Now, having documented and extensively studied the, the history and treasury of the Nizams of Hyderabad, I was convinced that if indeed such a magnificent stone had a Nizam connection, there would be a recorded history. You know, after all, we know about the Princey diamond and the, it was supposed to have once been part of the Nizam of Hyderabad's treasury and was then acquired by Van Cleef and Apples. So from India to England in archives, libraries, palace records, letters and correspondences with the presumption of guilty till proven innocent I hunted for the proverbial needle in the haystack. And slowly, bit by bit, the history of the gem unraveled. It almost seemed to me that the diamond itself had felt that the time had come for it to tell its story. The diamond was discovered between 1826 and 1830, and it was first seen in the hands of a native child who was playing with it was playing with the diamond rough. As I said earlier, the gem, the rough weighed 400 to 450 carats. The stone was broken. The smaller piece was sold to a local banker for 70,000 rupees. A phenomenal sum of money in 1830, mind you, 70,000 rupees. But the larger piece, the larger rough was deposited in the treasury of the gentleman the top left side of your screen, Nasirud Daula, the fourth Nizam of Hyderabad. The rough stone was shown off. It was a great discovery. It was shown off to many a European visitor to the Nizam's court. Captain Fitzgerald of the Bengal artillery, who was attached to the Nizam's service, saw the rough gem. And he presented a lead model of the stone to Henry Peddington, the gentleman the bottom left side of your screen who was the curator of Museum of Economic Geology in Calcutta. Piddington was the first person who measured the model and estimated the weight to be approximately 277 carats. Fitzgerald then presented a report which was published in the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in November 1847. And in the journal in front of you, the Journal of the Franklin Institute of London. Fitzgerald, on the right side of the page, even included a drawing of the stone, showing its form and size. And in his words, he concluded, this stone, hitherto unknown, may now be classed among the larger descriptions of diamonds which we read of, but seldom see. It was also estimated by both Fitzgerald and Piddington that when the stone was cut, if it were cut, it would yield a gem of about 138.5 carats. Although he was not able to determine if the stone was 
of pure water, that is flawless, he opined that the natives of India, and particularly the Deccan, are two good judges of diamonds and would not have paid the princely sum of 70,000 rupees in 1830 for a fraction of the stone if they did not if they had not seen the super gem that lay inside the rock. News of the diamond was reported in local newspapers in England. In an article titled An Enormous Diamond in the Manchester Courier of 1848, the news of the gem was declared and described as much larger than a pigeon's egg. And it went on to say, it is enough to tempt the least locomotive beyond the seas on the chance of picking up some of the gems of Ormus or of Ind, almost inviting people to go on to India saying diamonds of such magnificent size and quality are still available for the picking. The glass model, the top right side of your screen, was presented to Queen Victoria. And along with the Kohinoor in the bottom, right, was exhibited at the Crystal Palace Exhibition of 1851. You can see the Indian court in the Crystal Palace on the left side of your screen. The newspapers reported, and I quote, the model of the great Nizam, it was already known as the Nizam diamond, rivaled that of the Kohinoor, was regarded with great interest. Now, while there appears to have been much excitement about the diamond in England, the situation in India in the Nizam's court was fraught with financial problems. The treasury was depleted to fund wars in political strategies and to pay for British support in the incessant wars that the Nizam had to fight. The Nizam acquired large loans from money lenders and mercantile firms like Palmer and Company, founded by one William Palmer. Incidentally, for those of you who are in London, joining this webinar from London, William Palmer's grandson, Edward Palmer, established the famous Veera Swami restaurant uh, in Regent Streets, London. In 1851, the Nizam's accumulated arrears were so enormous that he was compelled to cede large revenue yielding tracts of land to the British to pay off his debts. He was still not out of the red, however, and he obtained a large loan in 1852 from a consortium of money lenders who had established a bank in Hyderabad under the chairmanship of one Henry Dighton. To secure the loan, the Nizam had to pledge a large portion of his jewels as security. He even offered the uncut diamond to the British resident General Fraser in return for the liquidation of his debt in 18, which in 1852 was approximately 600,000 pounds. The offer of the diamond uh, to liquidate his debts uh, hit the headlines in England. Newspapers even declared that it would add to Governor General Lord Dalhousie's fame that he had given to England the second and third largest diamond extent in the world. The largest at that time being the 1,500 carat Draganza diamond, and the second and third being the Kohinu and the Nizam, respectively. It went on to say that it would make England the envy of Russia. However, since the diamond was still uncut, its true value could not be determined and the offer was rejected. The Jar diamond was pledged to local bankers. The jewels were given to Henry Dighton, who actually surreptitiously shipped the jewels to England, to Holland, and attempted to sell them to recover his money. By this time, the fifth Nizam had died and was succeeded by the little young boy, two and a half, two and a half year old, Mehbub Ali Khan, seated in the center of the photograph on the left side of your screen. He was the sixth Nizam of Hyderabad. As a minor, Mehboob was placed under the regency of the dynamic Prime Minister Salar Jung. Salar Jung devoted his energies to organizing the affairs of the state and even got, managed to get the Nizam diamond out of pawn. He even retrieved all the jewels that had been pledged to Henry Dighton. We don't know whether he managed to retrieve all the jewels, but nevertheless, he did manage to retrieve a large uh, number of the pieces that had been pledged. 
Thereafter, I don't have time to go into the details, but the diamond is mentioned in various reports, in publications by visitors who came to the Nizam's court. On the right side of your screen, in his seminal work, Famous Diamonds, Ian Balfour includes the Nizam among the, world, among the world's greatest diamonds. He observes that the stone is, and I quote, shrouded in mystery about which little appears to be known for sure. Its history had not yet been told. It was not unusual for an important stone to be known by different names as it traveled through history and ownership. Our diamond this evening was variously referred to originally as the Bala Kohinoor, but as its journey began as the Great Diamond, the Hyderabad Diamond, Lendian, the Nizam's Jewel, and finally, simply, the Nizam. In fact, the diamond appears to have been christened the Nizam by the gentleman on the screen in front of you. He's the renowned explorer, writer, orientalist, and ethno ethnologist, Captain Richard F. Burton. Burton wrote during his travels through Hyderabad, and I quote, it is impossible to quit Golconda without noticing the great diamond whose unauspicious name, Bana or Little Kohinoor, I would alter to the Nizam. Burton describes the stone as being of the finest water. He gives its measurements, describes its form, and concludes it will easily cut into a splendid brilliant, larger and more variable than the present Kohinoor. Burton considered it uh, inauspicious, primarily because of the large uh, quantity of financial debts that had befallen the Nizam. I was not able to identify exactly when and where the diamond was cut. But going through the records, the palace records, it was most likely cut sometime in the early 20th century under instructions from Mehru Ali Khan, the sixth Nizam, the gentleman on the screen. He was a great connoisseur of gems and acquired magnificent jewels um, and commissioned fabulous gems uh, during his reign. He even acquired uh, a fabulous collection of uh, emeralds from the, uh, from the Tsar of Russia's treasury. There were various suggestions in Hyderabad, including one to ship the stone to Amsterdam to be cut by the firm of Royal Costers. Um, of Amsterdam, uh, the firm that cut the Kohinoor. Sadly, those of you who know about that cutting, we know they reduced the gem from 187 carats to 105.6 carats. Thankfully, the offer was declined. So the stone was most likely cut in Madras, where I am at the moment, where skilled diamond cutters resided. The name of Mr. Aratun of Madras appears in some documents. The Arathuns were diamond cutters, were Armenian diamond cutters and gem dealers based in Madras. The photograph, the two photographs on the top of the top right of the screen is the Armenian church in Madras. Madras is today known as Chennai. It was constructed in 1712. It's one of the oldest churches in India located on Armenian Street in what is known as Georgetown, the, the hub um, of, of all the dealers. That's where they all resided. And if you look closely at the photograph at the bottom right of your screen, it's one of the gravestones um, in the Armenian church. And I've uh, framed it in red over there. You can see you know, the, gems, the gravestones in the Armenian church um, are those of the gem dealers, the silk merchants, they dealt in expensive spices. And if you look slowly, you can actually see the weighing scale on their gravestones. It kind of identifies them as being gem dealers. So it was most likely cut in Madras, perhaps by the firm of Arathu. Nevertheless, by the end of Mahbub's reign in 1911, the diamond was cut into a slightly irregular pear-shaped diamond. Importantly, as I told you right at the beginning, to prevent wastage and loss of weight. It now weighed 120.8 carats. 
and you can see the beautiful stone on the screen in front of you. Mehboob was succeeded by his son, Mir Osman Ali Khan, who ruled as the seventh and last Nizam of Hyderabad. Now, in 1944, Herbert Smith, the then president of the Gemological Association of Great Britain, wrote to the Under Secretary of State India office in London, and the letter is there in the center of the screen, inquiring, and I quote from the letter, whether the historical diamond known as the Nizam is still in the possession of the Nizam of Hyderabad. Arthur Lothian, the British resident in Hyderabad, put the question to the Nizam, standing on the left side of the screen during one of his weekly meetings, only to be rebuffed. The Nizam was furious that he had been questioned about his personal possession. In his words, in Arthur Lothian's words, the Nizam flared up in the most extraordinary way and considered the query and interference in his personal affairs. The Nizam even asked how the British government would like it if he inquired about the king's private possession. He said his father had already had enough trouble over a diamond and had to suffer the indignity of having to give evidence about it this refers to the famous Jacob Diamond case. That's a story for another day. And the Nizam said that he would rather throw his diamonds into the gutter than to have to suffer such an insult. He repeated more than once this absurd phrase about throwing his diamonds into the gutter and was literally shaking all over. I realized then that I had unwittingly started off a brainstorm. That was Arthur uh, Lothian's correspondence to England. The last mention we have of the, of the Nizam diamond is in the note on the bottom right side of the screen. Again, I have framed it in red. I, sorry, it's not clear, but all these old notes have faded so much. In the note, the Nizam wrote to Lothian apologizing for losing his temper. He also declared that the diamond, and he mentions the diamond, was an heirloom of the Nizam's family and that it must remain with care, safety, and as a sacred trust in the family for generations to come. In August 1947, sorry, Sorry, in August 1947, approximately 562 princely states ceased to exist in India and became a part of the Indian Union. Faced with the loss of revenue from taxes that maintained their lives in the olden days and their lifestyles, the Maharajas, big and small, the Nawabs, the Nizams, all of them turned to the only source of easily disposable wealth in their hands, their treasury the gems and jewels that had been collected over many, many generations. Much of this collections, uh, not only from the Nizam's treasury, but from all over India, was sold off. Fortunately, the Nizam of Hyderabad had established three jewelry trusts, and the government of India acquired a small portion of the collection, literally numbering 175 items. The Nizam diamond, I think, probably left Hyderabad during these turbulent years, immediately in the aftermath of 1947. Perhaps it was sold to raise money or having been cut and its true value realized, pledged to a wealthy person as collateral for a large loan. There is, on the top of the screen, there is a tantalizing reference to a diamond in a 2011 court case against the notorious Hyderabad-based meat dealer, Hassan Ali Khan. In rejecting his bail request, the judge on the case cited the charges against him, stating that, and I quote, he had sold a diamond from the collection of the Nizam of Hyderabad. He had routed the sale proceedings through his account in Saracen Bank in Basel, Switzerland, to the Barclays Bank in the United Kingdom. Newspaper reports speculated that the diamond was sold for more than $700,000. Today, the diamond resides in a 
a private collection. The GIA report states that, and I quote, its clarity, color, and cut mirrored that of a rare Golconda gem. It was formally graded as being D color, topmost on the color scale. The report further states, it is exceedingly rare to find a large diamond more than 100 carats with such an enviable colorlessness. Classified as type 2A, chemically pure with virtually no detectable nitrogen impurities. The Nizam, as you can see in the on the screen in front of you, is an irregular pear shape. While it is commonly believed that a symmetrical outline is imperative, that is, that is the mantra today, that a symmetrical outline is imperative for even facet distribution and optimization of brilliance, it is evident that the lapidary, the Indian lapidary or the Armenian lapidary, who cut the gem sought to celebrate its original form by enhancing its natural shape. He shaped the stone <coughs> as a brilliant pair, closely following the contours of the rough, maintaining maximum size, yet skillfully liberating the radiance that was embedded in, within. In fact, the 120.8 carat pair brilliant is, and I quote from the GIA report, as much a masterpiece of human ingenuity as it is of nature. The massive size of the rough would have been impressive, but the vision and skill of the cutter who created a wondrous diamond of unique proportions and character are what makes the stone truly remarkable. So read all about it and more details about the story in the fascinating, it's part of the fascinating diamond stories in our book, Diamonds Across Time, published by the World Diamond Museum. Thank you all. Wonderful, wonderful. It really, thank you so much for this very, very fluent and, and, and a wonderful uh, presentation. I think it was riveting and uh, we have learned a lot. Um, I have, a, um, of course, we have a, a lot of people with us that we know and cherish. Uh, our good friend Adolfo de Basilio from uh, Spain asks the following question. Can you please tell us about the relationships between the Nizams and the Spanish monarchs regarding the exchange of Colombian emeralds and Golcondo dim Golconda diamonds? Do you have any uh, knowledge about that, about that happening? Uh, not so much with the Spanish monarchs, but you know, there was a very vibrant, the, the Portuguese were in India. And um, after the discovery of the new world and the discovery of the Colombian mines, large quantities of emeralds flowed from the new world to Spain and Portugal, and then on to India. India was the gem bazaar of the world. It was the greatest market for gemstones, whether it was Golconda diamonds, Colombian emeralds, Burmese rubies, uh, precious gemstones from Sri Lanka, from Afghanistan, from Thailand. They were all traded in, traded in the gem bazaars of India. Uh, Goa, Goa uh, on the Western coast was one of the uh, great entrepots of the gem trade. And the Nizams were the richest. Uh, it was the largest native state. Um, in 1947, the Nizam of Hyderabad was declared as the, the wealthiest man in the world. And emeralds, because of their green color and the, the symbolism of paradise uh, to the Islamic ruler, they were acquired in large quantities. So while the diamonds from the Golconda mines flowed in the Nizam's treasury, large quantities of emeralds were purchased. All our Maharajas stationed their agents in these gem buying centers to acquire the best gemstones. Okay. Um... A question by Shreya Kapoor. Um, you mentioned that the Nizam right now is in a private collection. Uh, have there been or are there opportunities to ever view it? Um, well, it was it was on exhibition at TFAF in 2019. Yeah, TFAF and in, the, in the Netherlands. In, in the Netherlands, in Maastricht. Mm -hmm. And I hope, uh, you know, one of these days when we when we do another big exhibition of diamonds, uh, the private collector is very generous. He's willing to exhibit the stone and share it with the world for people to see. 
So yes, I hope we will be able to put it on exhibition sometime so soon. That is part of what we are trying to do with the World Diamond Museum, yes. to get stones to see that have not been seen and will not be seen uh, 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 in the future, even if we only can do it digitally. And that's why that's we right. actually came into existence. Uh, another question, um, is it fair to say that the diamonds from the 38 mines, this is new to me, in the Golconda area also came in type 1A, and that the only the largest finest were type 2a diamonds this is a question by rui galopo in the cavallo second question how many of those large special diamonds have reached from india have reached europe um is that known so he is asking about are the big stones by definition type 2a and are the smaller ones type 2 1 and um, how many big stones have reached Europe or in other collections? I think, uh, you know, this whole type one and type two is a modern classification. Mm -hmm. um, so 38 mines are believed to have yielded in excess of 12 million carats of diamonds. And, and just as uh, other diamonds in the world, for example, in Africa and elsewhere, have not all yielded, uh, even the largest stones are not all type Two A stones. So, in the same manner, uh, the Golconda mines yielded a large variety of stones, and they also yielded beautiful colored diamonds. We ha we have the Hope Diamond, we have the Dresden Green Diamond. Uh, so that was the range of diamonds. According to a lot of people, um, the some of the best stones, for example, like the Kohinu, the Nizam, probably came out of the Kolur diamond mines. Uh, which was one of the uh, important diamond mines in this region known as Golconda. But in India, historically, and even today, I refer to every diamond that came out of these 38 mines that are of Indian origin as being Golconda diamonds. I think the, the tendency today to brand the term Golconda to be associated only with type 2A is doing grave injustice to the large quantities of beautiful diamonds that came out of India. Now, in response to the second question, they are dispersed. So many, so many diamonds, and especially diamonds, were cut to camouflage their historical identities and to camouflage, to erase their historical provenance, because there was so much of litigation in, in you know, uh, post-independent India, when there were families that were fighting each other and matters were going to court. And there were people you know, selling off um, the fabulous gemstones in their treasury. And I think you know, somebody like Harry Winston, who, who, who acquired large quantities of stones from India, was one of those who was guilty of recutting a lot of these stones and completely erasing their histories. So until we have um, a scientific me mechanism to determine mine of origin of diamonds, uh, we will always be shooting in the dark and trying to guess what came from where. Okay. Um, another uh, a question that um, uh, follows um, uh, Rui's question about 38 mines. Do we know their locations? And has there been done any exploration of those locations that are proven to be um, uh, diamond and furs? Uh, do they have any commercial future? Is there, is there, we know about the Bandro mine that Rio Tinto has been, uh, as, is operating. We read about the occasional find of a large stone, uh, but there is no organized mining apart from that from, and there should be so much underground still in India to, uh, to find. Yeah, so the 38 mines, I think importantly, what we must remember is, you know, place names have changed. Uh, we are talking about the antiquities of these mines that goes back uh, 1,500 years, back 1,500 years. We have names of mines, for example, mentioned in a text called the Artha Shastra of Kautilya, which goes back to the 5th century BCE. Now, over, over hundreds of years, place names have changed. So it's becoming, it has become very difficult to connect ancient place names with modern names. Sometimes the villages have ceased to exist, entire districts have been redrawn, uh, but 
when you trace the names of the uh, of references uh, through history, we have been able to identify that at one time there were approximately about 38 mines that were active. Some of them have a recorded history because, again, as I said, the names have not changed so drastically. So we are able to connect the vernacular names with, with the more uh, the English spellings of the names. Now, regarding your second question, these were alluvial mines. They were all alluvial mines. Therefore, the, the, surf, the diamonds were all largely surface mines. Um, they haven't yet been able to trace uh, the, the, the kimberlite pipes, the mother load, as it were, of yeah. the diamonds. I think there is a lot of um, investigation going on now, uh, even in the, in the Panna region, which was another region where there were diamond mines that were located in India. And uh, because you know, new modern diamond mining techniques are now available and at their disposal, so there is a lot of exploration that's going on. But whether it is economically viable uh, mining these diamonds, what is the quality of dive stones that is going to come out of these mines? I mean, these are all explorations it's, that are it's, ongoing. It's, it's for a completely different webinar and topic. Yeah, yes, sure. Three last questions. We have a question um, uh, that goes back to one of your slides where you showed the various names that the Nizam was given. And one of those names was Lendien uh, in a French uh, manner. So that's just another yes. name for the Nizam, right? That's right. That's okay. right. Very good. Then a, um, another question. Uh, your research, uh, you mentioned going into archives, into endless researches in, uh, in various location palaces. How much of it is in English? How much of it is in other languages that you have mastered or needed to master? Or you, um, a, um, of course, archives when they were under the British were in English, but were there also archives in in Indian, uh, um, in in Hindi or in other uh, languages? Uh, and 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 writ, of course, yes. Yes, there, there is. Uh, in fact, uh, in the Hyderabad State Archives, there are millions of documents in in Persian and in Urdu. Um, I was able to access some of those, but I work with another Persian translator who helps me uh, to read these documents, who helps me to, uh, you know, translate these documents. So there are documents, especially, you see, the diamond mines of Golconda stretch from literally the eastern uh, coast, the Bay of Bengal, right up to the Arabian Sea. So we are talking about Persian, we're talking about Urdu, we're talking about Telugu, it's Kannada, it's Marathi, so many languages. Uh, across this entire region, in the archives are extremely rich, but paucity of funds, paucity of people uh, to document, to translate these documents. Uh, we are all the time faced with uh, a cash crunch or something like this. And a lot of it hasn't yet been um, cataloged properly. So it's not possible to go into a database and immediately access what you're looking for. So one has to work with the local archiver person in charge. And I've spent long, long days and long, long weeks in Hyderabad. Uh, coming out of my research of the Nizam of Hyderabad's jewels, you know, that goes back many, many years. For nearly two decades, I've been researching those jewels. So whenever I come across mention of, of a great stone, of a great diamond, I kind of collect that information and put it away and go back to it again when the time comes. Thank you. Um, before we conclude, the last question that we are, will be asked, have asked and will be asked in future uh, speakers as well. And I asked you permission in advance to ask this question. Um, how did you get into this topic? I mean, we're such a small, we are such a small industry. Uh, we're uh, from top to bottom as an industry, we're very small. And then in our niche, you're even, we're even smaller. And there's just so few of you. How did you get into this niche? And, and what kept you in it and what keeps you going? <laughs> I, I'm Indian. I'm from India, the gem capital of the world, the gem trading center of the world. Um, but, you know, uh, as a youngster, uh, I, was, I used to be taken to the temple uh, by my grandmother. And one of the important things in India is, is this concept of adornment. Adornment with jewels is a very, very important part of the adornment of the deity in temple rituals. Um, this morning, in fact, at 5.30, I actually went because we have the local temple festival that's on 
to see the adornment, um, the most magnificent jewels. I've seen these jewels from, from a very, very young age. Uh, and then I, I studied art history. I got interested in Indian history and culture. And, uh, and then I realized at some point, you know, how everything was so interconnected because jewelry was one part for me, every piece of jewelry talks to me in so many languages. It's not just about, it's not just about the jewel and design, the gems tell their story, the gold tells its story, on whose skin it once laid tells another story, from where it came tells a story of its own. So for me, all these stories are resounding in my ears at the same time when I see a gemstone or a piece of jewel, I'm just fascinated. It's something that, you know, I, I love doing what I do. Well, I think you sh we share that with everybody who is with us and uh, we hope that you will have many years of more of productivity and of and of passion because that's what we share. Thank with. you. Alex, Thank can you. you speak already or not? Is your microphone working? No, it is not. Um, Alex is uh, waving to everybody and I speak for the chairman, for the chairman of the uh, World Diamond Museum in, uh, in, in thanking you, Usha, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, the recording will be made available soonest. As I said at the beginning, uh, we had many apologies for people not being able to attend. Some said, I'm going to be on the plane, I'm going to be on the train, I have other things to do. I'm, uh, that I and I will be looking forward to seeing the recording. So we're going to have uh, more, going to get more mileage out of this for sure. It was a wonderful presentation that many of us will also want to look at uh, and and watch again. And therefore, it will be soon on our YouTube channel. We will make the announcement on by our press release on our uh, Facebook page and by and on the various Facebook pages of the groups that we have been uh, publishing this to. Um, we are going to conclude. Uh, with two, two more remarks. Uh, your book, Munu, uh, Vision and Passion, is out. It is part of the World Diamond uh, Museum uh, book series. The, um, um, you can go to facetsofmankind.org to see the other publications that we have done. And we conclude by announcing the next webinar that will take place on April 1. And that's not a joke. Um, it will be called Rhapsody in, uh, Rhapsody in Blue, the Art and Science of Blue Diamonds by Dr. John King, formerly of GIA, but uh, we will um, uh, do, um, discover many more facets of, of his um, uh, um, uh, talents and, and, his, uh, his, and also his artistic talents. But he is a foremost and well-known, if not world-renowned, expert of colored uh, diamonds. So with that, um, with your permission, I will conclude this webinar. I thank everybody. Um, uh, Dr. Roy, thank you so much, Alex, um, Vrinda, or everybody else who was helpful here. I think it was a wonderful second episode of our webinar series, and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>